Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're going to look at the first submission by Miriam of her horse, Lady. Now, Lady was a horse who was a school horse, evidently. Miriam came back to riding after uh, riding as a child and young adult, and took some years off, and came back to it and started riding at a riding school where this horse was uh, a school horse. Um, she decided to purchase the horse, or take it over, I'm not sure which there, but... Uh, the horse had a history of lameness, and we're going to go through a lot of that. This is actually going to show us quite a bit about the horse today. But she started having inflammation problems there, as you see from here. And she did remove the horse from working in this school and decided to try to rehab the horse on her own, which she's done a very good job of here, and you'll see why I get to the end of it. Um, she had a lot of feet problems and swollen leg problems, and uh, she had to be injected in an SI joint. And of course, all these problems come from just being ridden upside down, just like your car. If you take the shocks off of it and loosen up the lug nuts for a while and drive it, you'll see what will happen to it. Well, that's what happens to horses that are ridden much of, much of the same way. Their wheels are kind of falling off and they've got no shock absorbers because they're never taught to work correctly. But I really salute anybody like this who will take the time and loves this animal enough to take the time to really try to rehab it. Most of them are, uh, if you're willing to just take the time. And a lot of people just simply, you know, they have one horse and it's too expensive to take care of them. So it's move on and get another one, move on and get another one. But, you know, I have always found that when we rehab these horses, they always come back to us and become very willing if we're willing to spend the time that it takes to get them there. So she goes back to the very beginning here with some lunging work. And does a lot of, gets away from riding the horse, as you can see, they were jumping it, they were trying to do all kinds of things with it, and uh, most of it was uh, not going well. So, here she is just in the beginning phases of getting the horse to lunge. And we see that the horse is already here starting to relax quite a bit compared to what we just saw there a moment ago. And starting to swing over her back a little bit. But when horses have been going upside down, especially when they're used uh, like in a riding school where they're ridden way too much, they get way too much work and of course none of it any good. So they just kind of, they get a lot of small problems. Their feet just start falling apart, you know, their backs start falling apart, their legs start falling apart. And as you experience with this one, all of a sudden she was having mysterious swelling ups in her legs, which of course means that, you know, a numerous thing is that her legs were being overstressed and also that she's not getting enough circulation through her legs. But here she is doing a little bit of a leg yield mounted, and she does quite well. And there's a couple of times throughout this video that she has to lay the horse off again for unsoundness problems and brings it back. But she does a better job, and every time it comes back, it seems to look better and better. Of course, had a lot of tension problems, obviously, but those are beginning to work them their way out. And as we will see later on in this, it just gets better and better as she goes and the time progresses. And we've seen horses uh, come back... Some of the oldest ones that we have worked and brought back, uh, personally, I, the oldest ones I've done is 27 years old. And uh, as you see with many of the horses that we have, like Contigo, who's now 23, coming 24 years old, who was lame from the time he was four, actually, and is now the sound for the first time in his life. So if you're willing to just put the time in, if you get them to the other side of it, it's always worth it. So here the horse looks a little better, but you can see the horse is it's quite a stiff-legged kind of horse in the way it moves. But that's more the way it has simply gone its whole life. But it's starting to already here look a little better. The back is looking better. It's starting to swing a little better. I think with the horse like this, the biggest thing is you just have to continue to go along slowly. Now here this is starting to look really nice. What an improvement that we've made from the beginning. Here the horse is really stretched. And I really encourage all of you... Um, with these kind of older horses or rehab horses, just remember how much work you can get done just at a walk. If you can get the horse to stretch over its back at a walk, you can usually get anything else. Because if the horse is really unsound, it'll even be unsound in the walk. But if we can work them, you know, so as I say, it's so many times these horses that have been, you know, badly ridden their whole lives, you know, they're just, they have a lot of soreness problems as we bring them back, much as a person would do. This is all looking pretty good here. And we see the step is starting pretty nice and regular starting to stretch into it. And even here in the canter, she's even starting to stretch a little bit in the canter. But I think that your problem probably at this point, because you start having some soundness problems again, I think you maybe just have done a little bit too much too soon with this horse. 
you just got to remember when they're in this kind of shape when you start, it's going to take quite a while. That is, you know, in the in meaning quite a while, like in even a year, just to, to spend a lot of time just getting the horse stretching over its back. If the horse is, you know, 10 or 11, 12 years old, by the time you start this stuff, you remember they've had years and years of bad riding, so it will take a while. So we can see in that last one that the trot had kind of deteriorated all of a sudden a little bit. So, you know, once again, if you're having to inject the back, what that also tells me is that right away, you know, I think what, where you went wrong is just you doing a little bit too much too soon with a horse like this. So I think you have to really back off and just take your time. This is an interesting thing. So the horse was standing and certainly standing more comfortably, but you can also see that the back is still dropped. The belly is distended, not really pushing up to the back yet. So that would be my take on this, as I think you might have just done a little bit too much too soon. We're always in a hurry, you know, to move forward. But with these rehab products, that if they've had unsoundness, you know, it really takes a long time because if we start to get them over their backs, their feet are going to change. All of a sudden, they're going to have correct, you know, pressure on their feet, and the shoeing will make a big difference, all of these things. And it's just best if we take our time. So we can see here, yes, the horse does look a little uneven and a little stiff there. Same thing here. All of a sudden, the horse has gotten tightened up compared to what we saw. So for me, I don't get out of a walk until the walk is consistent. When the walk is consistent, then I go to the trot. And the trot's consistent and staying in the stretch and over the back, then I would go to the canter, unless it happens accidentally. But it's very rare. Now, once in a while, you know, one out of every few hundred that I see, um, they actually canter better than they trot. And if that's the case, it's okay to do a little canter. But you have to be careful with a horse like this, because obviously with that leg swelling, this horse was having a lot of leg stress. And once again, a lot of that can be, as you're bringing the horse back, just, you know, getting the horse even on its feet. If the horse hasn't been over its back, its feet are going to wear strangely. So it takes quite a bit of a while just to get everything back the way it should be. That is, the feet are beginning to work correctly. They're getting the right kind of pressure through the frog that's sending the blood back up the legs. A lot of people don't realize that the foot is actually a secondary heart. The horse actually has five hearts. It's one inside its body and one on the end of each foot. So every time the horse steps, it pumps the blood. That's why it's so important that we have frog contact with the horse because it's the frog pushing up into the foot that pumps the blood back up the leg. So if you're having trouble with the horse uh, stocking up, that tells me a couple of things, that there may be some problems with, with the horse's uh, chewing and that it may not have its any frog pressure, which means that the horse is not pumping the blood back up the leg or it's standing too much and just not walking enough relative to the amount of work that it's doing. So all those things can be factors this, and it's always a matter of time. You know, when you first get a horse been hollow its whole life and dragging itself along by its front legs, it's going to take six months just to get the feet, once the horse is over its back, that the feet begin to take the right shape because they will be working in the right way of taking the right amount of pressure. The good work in hand here. So I think if anything, you could have maybe just taken a little more time, and now that you know you have gone back and forth a couple of times, we know that we really want to take time and you want to spend much more time building the source's top line if you know you've already had back problems. We know we have to be very careful with that. Now that's another thing is you know you got to be sure that your saddle is fitting correctly that your you know that's, that your saddle isn't creating more problems when you get up there. It's very often the case if you find either it's just the weight or the saddle pinching but the horse goes quite freely without you up there and then you get up and the horse literally feels like it can't move. Well, that's got to tell you a little something about what the back is doing and how prepared it is for doing the work that you're asking it to do. And not bad work in hand here. You're, you're getting some moments when you're getting the horse to cross over a little bit as you are there. And you get a better stretch after that. Like that. So this is all coming very well, I think. Everything I've seen here, you've certainly begun to come in the right direction. When the horse is sound, it was looking quite good. So something went wrong somewhere along the way. And once again, that can be just that you just did a little too much. It sounds like this horse has back problems. So we've got to be very careful about the, putting the weight up there, that we really take our time and do a lot of walk work with the horse, stretched out in the walk, and take, really taking our time before we get up into the canter. You have to remember, the faster you go, 
uh, the pressure is increased on the horse's feet exponentially. I mean, at a gallop, the research has shown something like 5,000 pounds of pressure per square inch at a full gallop on the horse's feet. So, you know, now a canter and a trot is certainly nothing like that. But still, it, the faster you go, the harder it is on the horse's legs. So, take our time. So I say about the people who settled the West, they didn't gallop out there, they walked out there. <laughs> you know, you can only gallop a horse so far but you can walk quite a ways. So all this work in hand, this is all looking like it's coming along you know, quite good. I can't see, obviously, in this video close up to see exactly what your arms, and, uh, what your arms are doing there in your contact with the rain, but it looks like it's coming around quite well. Not seeing any big problem here. We saw someone else uh, who just uh, put some photographs where they had taken a photograph of the same horse in the same spot every week or so and saw how much it changed. That might be a great idea for everybody to do, and, and especially for someone like yourself bringing this horse along, you know. Take it to the same spot on the wall there, you know, between B and whatever that is down there, and uh, take a picture once a week for your own edification and watch how the horse changes, or even take a little time-lapse photography if you can get the horse into the same spot. Because that's what makes this fascinating. If it was just getting on and riding a horse, I personally would find it pretty boring. But it's much more interesting when, you know, when we're actually trying to develop them. Because that, that really develops our relationship with them in that we have to be conscious of what they're feeling and the pain and the, the, the difficulties they have as in just being lame. But before they get lame, there's lots of other steps along the way where they start to stiffen up and these kind of things. And sometimes if we're more conscious of those kind of things and the little changes in the horse, which is what you will be aware of when you work a horse like this, where we get, we want to get them to that finely tuned place where they're stretching and everything can work correctly. And as soon as it doesn't, you go, hmm, what's going on here? What could be wrong? Is my saddle suddenly not fitting? Why did the horse do this perfectly well a week ago and now all of a sudden it doesn't? And we pretty much always find that that's some physical reason. Horses are pretty uh, even-tempered creatures, most of them, as long as we they know what to expect every day of us. That's why it's so important to build upon a system so the horse understands and isn't constantly being thrown things that it doesn't understand or physically can't do, which is, of course, what leads to... Um, most of the kind of difficulties we find with horses is that someone starts trying to ask the horse to do something it physically can't do, then the horse starts fighting, then the person starts fighting with it, trying to force it to do it. And at best, if the horse isn't physically capable of doing something, all you're going to get is some kind of forced frame position of something, which is really nothing at all. It only sets you back in real training. It was so sad this time around to watch the Olympic Games this time. And, you know, I was hoping after the last Olympics, you know, and we, where Charlotte Desjardins did so well, and uh, it almost seemed like it's gone the other way now in the sense the dressage was almost worse than ever. I mean, almost every horse had a lateral walk. They all looked upside down. And, uh, there was very little that I could have called dressage being done there. I said for once someone who pointed this out, it was interesting because the uh, three-day eventing dressage looked better than the so-called pure dressage, which is very telling. Of course, now we see that today another rider yet again was killed. Another one was killed just about a week ago. A three-day event rider was killed a couple of days ago in a rotational fall once again. If only I could get people to understand why this is happening. There's a reason all these people are dying these days because they're jumping hollow. And every time you jump a horse hollow or you jump by hanging onto the horse's mouth, you stand a very good chance of getting killed, even if it's just walking around. If you can't let go of the horse's mouth, it's going to fall on you if it starts to trip. It should be the first thing anybody learns in every, every beginner, the first lesson they learn, that if you feel the horse tugging out of balance, let them have the reins. Let the reins slip through your fingers so the horse can regain its balance. Is it's almost always riders that bring horses down on top of them. Most horses, uh, I've seen them recover some, from some amazing falls if the riders just let go of the reins.
This walk is getting to be a little better here. Not quite as good as the walk we saw earlier, but it's starting to come and starting to stretch a little better. Um, you said somewhere, I believe, in your letter that, uh, you know, you did a little canter to improve the trot, and people often say that, but I would be very aware of that, leery of doing that with a horse that's, that's had the kind of soundness problems that this horse has had. I would not canter this horse at all until I was absolutely certain this horse was completely sound at the walk and completely sound in the trot. So really take your time coming back this time. A lot of walk work because you've got the basic work here coming really well. If you will just take your time and uh, not be in a hurry to get through this, you'll probably come around and be just fine this time. The walk here could be a little more swinging. I'd like to see the horse stretching more than it's doing here. Now, it's certainly better than if it just had it head straight in the air, but we're not quite getting the stretch that we want yet. And you can see this horse just looking at its shape when you go by here. This horse is still quite overweight. Uh, the back is dropping when you put the weight on it. Um, you can see how the belly is still a little bit like a pregnant mare, so to speak. And when I see that much, it tells me this horse has a ways to go in terms of getting in enough physical shape to be able to do what you're asking it to do here and, and, uh, and do that well and stay sound. So keep watching that, and that's what you'll see improve. Once again, a good idea why to stand your horse up with no tack on in the same place once a week and take a picture of it and see how it changes over time. If you're doing it right, doing this work right, it will change. You'll see the, the withers will actually come up through the shoulders. You'll see the back flatten out behind the withers, and all that dip behind the saddle will disappear as the horse develops uphill. All horses can be brought into a more uphill position. People have the tendency to think, oh, well, and of course the expensive horses today are the ones that have that perfect confirmation, but any horse can improve that. In fact, it's almost uh, a, uh, a bad thing for the poor horses today because if they are built with that uphill uh, natural stance naturally, uh, they just get pushed into doing movements that much faster and ruined that much faster. This is why all the expensive ones are so expensive when they're born. I mean, when they're being sold as three and four year olds and, uh, and then they're being given away at seven and eight because now they're completely, their legs are completely shot. This is one thing we really have to work towards and we will, uh, of course, bring this under control in the World Dressage Federation. But the way it is today, all of these young horse maturities that, that we see in dressage and jumping world, they're just forcing all these young horses into all these phony frames which is really ruining them for the future use, for what it is that they're actually intending them for, which is kind of sad. So we must get all these breeders out of the idea that a three-year-old should look like a Grand Prix horse, because they don't, and of course when people try to force them to look like that, it just ruins the poor animal. Now this walk is starting to stretch a little better here. At least it's walking fairly regularly. There we go, and it starts to stretch down. That's what we're looking for. Like, we just never want to get out of walk. And I said, with a horse like this, you can have days where you do nothing but walk, and plenty of them. And that is what you should do as you sort of sequence the horse through its work. When it gets good on the lunge line, then you want to just get on and just do the work in the walk for a while and get the horse stretching in the walk till it feels really good. And when it feels like you could just put your leg on and send it forward and it will stretch right into the contact, that's what you want to do. But you can do a lot of this work in the walk. We just have to not be in a hurry. And once you get into doing the walk work, I personally find it absolutely fascinating. And I've often noticed that, you know, the best riders I've ever seen spend a lot of time walking and the worst ones spend almost none. So when you watch people school horses, ask yourself that. You know, when we see these Grand Prix horses, like so many that we saw at the last Olympic Games, you know, it, it looks like something, all this leg movement that people don't, you know, people aren't educated enough in dressage, which sadly today is many of the officials. Um, but they, because this has just become what they're used to seeing as the sort of breeders took over dressage, you know, since the 80s. And it sort of just turned into this thing about who could produce the super horse while the riding has gone down the tubes.
So I'd still like to see you getting this one uh, deeper into the stretch. At this point, on a particular day like this, if I hadn't got the horse to stretch deeper than this by the time we have done this for as long as you have here, I'd have gotten off and done the work in hand a little bit more. So remember, it's just important that you get there. It's not important that you be on the horse or on the ground. It's just important that you get the horse over the back every day. And if we get the horse over its back every day, in some period of time, no matter how that long that might take, and some of these rehab cases can take a long time, as you guys have seen with the, the horse Bailador, who I've been rehabbing now for three years. But now he's a rideable horse, but it took me three years to be able to keep him sound. And same kind of thing, we try to get him to go, and he immediately goes unsound again, and his problems were all on his back. If I'd canter him once, he'd be unsound the next day like that. He just couldn't, so I just didn't canter him for a long, long time. Now he can do everything. So it's taken about three years. But, you know, it always takes two years to put a foundation on a horse anyway. So with some of these extreme uh, rehab cases where we're starting at less than zero, so to speak, just like if you, you know, were rehabbing somebody who, you know, had a bad leg fall, they're not going to just get out of bed and start running three miles. It's going to take them a year at least just to bring that leg back, you know, into condition where they could think about starting to do all that other kind of thing. So that's what we have to remember. So as I said, by this point, I would have gotten off because the stretch isn't getting as deep as we would like it to under the saddle here, whereas you were getting that a lot, you know, uh, in the work in hand and in the walk work. So I'd like to see that a little sooner. There's nothing wrong with getting off and getting back on again. So if it takes you, you know, five or ten minutes and you're still not even getting the horse into a, a good stretch, I would get off. And if you can do it from the ground, do it from the ground, then get back up and see if it's there. If you can't get it there, you don't try to force it. You just get off and do the work in hand again. And then you would simply come back and try the same process again the next day. And pretty soon the horse will come out and one day you'll just stretch in the walk and you won't have to get off and do the, that reestablishing. But if you can't establish it, it simply means the horse is too weak in the back to carry you, which means that you shouldn't be on it then or for a little while longer. And you do the strengthening work from the ground. Because it just doesn't do you or the horse any good just to continue going not quite right because then the horse will start going not quite right in terms of soundness. So it's all going to pay a cost. And now we're getting a little, little better stretch, but still, as I said, I would have gotten off of here and done this from the ground by now again. And if I were giving you a lesson, that's exactly what I would have you do, because there's just, you know, we just don't want to spend much time, if any, with the horse not going correctly. So you would just get off and get the horse going correctly again. And it won't be long. Now it does, you're having moments here when the horse is kind of trying to stretch, but you know, the feeling that I'm getting from the horse, the way it's kind of dropping out there, you know, and losing the rhythm, it's just having a hard time. Now that's getting a little better as you're going though. But I think you would have gotten there sooner, if you get my point, by just getting off and working the horse deeper in hand and then getting back on again. You can do that three or four times, however mine it takes. And, you just, you know, you don't stop until you either get it uh, from on top, or if you don't get it on top within, you know, a couple of tries, then I would just do it in the walk and be done with that for today. And then come back and do the same sequence again the next day. I'd work the horse in hand. If I get up, if I can't get the horse into the stretch within a few minutes, then I'm just going to get off and work it in hand again. It will get stronger, as you've already seen here. You've brought this horse a long, long way from what, what you first began with. So if you keep up the good work, you will get there. And here the walk improves a little bit. It's a little more swingy, but still not quite all the way there, but better than it was a few moments ago. That's looking better there. But I think you get my point in that it just would be better to... Uh, to have to spend less time going up and down and getting the horse really deep into it in the work in hand and then coming back the next day and trying again. Now, having said that, you're having some success here. It's certainly not looking too bad, but it just needs to get deeper than it is. So the walk is getting more regular here, and there you go. Now you get a little bit deeper, so that's good. But if you kind of get my point, by getting on and off, you could have had all of this work could have been with the horse stretched. And then you get up there by maybe the 
second or third round of doing that, and the horse would stay stretched. And if it didn't, you'd just get off and finish with a stretch in hand. Because it just needs to be deeper yet than it's going here, from what I've seen. Though I have, there was a moment in one of the earlier uh, clips here where you had the horse really stretched down, and that's really what we're looking for. It's getting a little better here. Seems to be a little better in this direction also, which is something always to be conscious of. It's a good idea in most cases to just start on the side that, that is the easiest side for you to do because of the horse, once again, we want to spend as little time doing things wrong as possible. But this is getting to a pretty good place. But as I said, I'd like you to see to be able to get to this place and even deeper within a few moments, within a few minutes of getting on the back of the horse. But it's getting to a much better place now. But you can still see kind of, you just even move a little bit and the car kind of stumbles around a little bit there. And you can see that the belly is still down. And it's just not quite, you know, my, that's my feeling is it's just not quite strong enough to really do as much as you would like it to do right now and it would be better for it if you just did this at the walk without without being mounted so there we go so getting into the trot here we never really got the walk there so were it i i would not have gone into the trot because now the horse is just going hollow and now even though you may get it into a little better stretch here as time goes on once again it's too much time remember this horse has soundness issues so we really don't want to ride this horse hollow at all so you can see how the horse is just struggling. It's kind of pulling itself along with its shoulders here. The back isn't really engaging or being part of the movement here. And that's also why you see the horse swishing its tail. It's not, it's not happy with what's going on here in terms of it. You can see that it's just slightly uncomfortable. Now, different horses will express that in different ways. Some of them will just swish their tail, but that's what they're telling you when they're swishing their tail is that they're not quite comfortable. Now, some of them, of course, will buck you off. So... Uh, they express it more uh, dynamically or more violently, one might say. But if just a horse swishing its tail or grinding its teeth is trying to tell you it's not happy about what's going on. It's not comfortable in the movement. When horses are comfortable, they relax and stretch down and the tail stops swishing around. They stop grinding their teeth and their eyeballs stop rolling around in their head and they begin to like the work, that kind of being the point. So that was good that you didn't continue that. I certainly wouldn't have tried that any, any, any longer there at that moment without getting it where you wanted. So that's exactly what you did want to do is come back to the stretch. So the walk stretch is a little bit deeper, but you get my idea. She comes back and you see the hind legs and they're kind of a little bit like they're pulling up off a of fly paper or something. And uh, so to me, this horse is just doing a little bit more mounted work than I think it's really ready to do. But even though like the little bit of canter that you did looked pretty good, but on the other hand, you've got to remember how, how much that is putting pressure on those legs that you're trying to heal and on the back. So even while it might have done it pretty well, so it's that thing I would say is, well, just because you can do something doesn't mean you necessarily should do it. And I think that's the case with this horse. It might do a little more, but you want to really, really be conscious of... of getting every step as correct as you can, as quickly as you can when you're working the horse. So it spends as little time. As I said, a horse like this has already spent years and years basically going upside down, you know, like a car with no shock absorber. So that's why by the time you get it, now you've got all these leg problems and things because the legs are just already starting to wear out. The back is starting to wear out. I mean, if you're having to inject a horse at all, um, that tells you right away that you're, you've got a long way to go in terms of having the horse and that you really need to go slowly. So same thing here with this trot. It's just very short. Hind legs are kind of falling out behind. It's hollow and dropping its back. And you can see once again that swishing of the tail. And once, even though it's not that violent, I guarantee you the horse is trying to tell you it just doesn't feel right in what you're doing yet to itself. And you can see how it's very short in front, kind of stabbing its front legs which when it does that, it, that's basically because the horse is pulling with the shoulders. Like when you see a unecked horse, horses become unecked, that is that underside of the neck becomes very developed because they pull with their front legs. Horses can either pull you along or they can 
propel you along from behind, but if they don't have the back round, they can't propel you be from behind. Because it's only a round back that the, that the stride can complete itself through, does that make sense? The horse has to push up into that round back, and then the horse moves forward. If the back is hollow, all that happens when the horse tries to engage is the hips go up. Uh, and we saw that in many, many of the so-called Grand Prix horses we saw at the last Olympic Games. They're trying to do a Piaffa Passage, and their hips are going higher than the withers. So that should tell you how hollow the horses are when that happens. That tells you the horse can't complete the stride. But this kind of phony floating trot, people have begun, you know, because it's so dramatic. Once again, 25 years ago, no one had horses that moved like these new horses do. And so they're fooled by it. All of a sudden, these horses even pulled into phony frames. They Like, if you tried to do that with this horse that you're having, uh, you know, there would be nothing there for anybody would look at it. And everybody would say, go, oh, what a terrible moving horse. But they do that to these you know, half a million dollar horses, and they've got so much leg action, they pull the neck in, and there's still all these legs are going everywhere that looks impressive to people who don't know what they're looking at. Just as saddlebreds and Tennessee walkers and all of these kinds of things look impressive to people who don't know anything about horses. But a real horseman would say what my father used to say with me, because I grew up in Kentucky, and every time he'd see a saddlebred, he'd go, huh. They'd never make it to the next town riding like that. You've all seen me say that before. But that's a real truism, and it's really so true of what's happened in riding today because no one really has to use horses except at horse shows for doing much of anything. You know, they don't have to depend upon them. If they don't make it to this horse show, they give them an ejection, they make it to the next one. But you get my point. They don't have to keep them sound, and nobody's life is dependent on it. But really, that's where they should think because people's lives are dependent on it. And so many people are losing their lives today because they're riding these horses that are super horses. They jump very naturally. They have all this phony movement that you can pull them into this frame. But it's always them and the jumping people. And even some of the dressage people. We've had people falling down lately at the walk. you know, And everyone is all worried about... As you've all heard me say, I'm all for wearing helmets, but if people would ride their horses over the backs, we'd have a lot less people getting killed. You know, people, back when people used to know how to ride, or more of they did, people wore little skull caps at best, and no one even worried about it. And you never saw the kind of numbers of people being killed like you're seeing getting killed and injured today. It's all for one reason. You know, it'd be as if you're putting people behind the wheel of a Formula One car, that doesn't have any brakes on it or has an axle that's about to break and saying, oh, go on the track and go for it. Look, you're like a race car driver until the axle breaks or the wheels fall off. Now, this is a little better stretch here you're doing at the end. That's what I'd like to see you be able to do within a few minutes of getting on the horse. And if you can't get that within a minute or two, I would just get off, as I said, and do the work in hand. Now, all the trot work that we saw here today really didn't have any value. He never got over his back enough for that to be any good. So just... and here at the end at least you didn't do it for very long so you tried it it wasn't there and you came back to the walk and that's exactly what you do want to do but this is a better walk here that you're getting finally at the end still seeing a little swishing of the tail and I'd like to see more overreach and still just basically looking at the horse you know I can just tell looking at it still quite dipped behind the saddle, the belly is still hanging low. So I can tell you this horse has ways to go, but I know you had a little setback there. You had it going quite well, and then you had another sound of setback. So this time I really want you to take your time and really stick to this idea of only doing what you can do correct. So really keeping it in the walk um, as long as you need to until you get the horse really swinging and active. And then you'll come back and uh, you'll find that the trot, when you go right into the trot and the horse can stretch right into it, you'll know he's ready to trot. So really good job here. I really commend you for bringing this horse along, you know, and caring enough to, to get this horse out of the situation as a school horse, which is never a good situation these days because, of course, it's so expensive that school horses get ridden much, much too much. And, of course, they're never really schooled correctly. So, you know, they just go down the, the same uh, thing as this one has gone down. So uh, kudos to you for doing so. I think you're going to get this horse. We saw some moments that it was really good. Keep working on it. Uh, this is Will Favor from Archeride. I look forward to seeing you again in the not-too-distant future and in Norway.